let's get started. And uh, so as you can see from the appearances, today's session is somewhat different from the previous one. So the last three sessions, uh, we've essentially been doing the maths. Uh, and now this is going to be a very practical session where we look at PyJoint and PyJoint code and attempt to understand how what we've done glues together into uh, something that we actually use. So in order to do this, uh, we're going to keep the example that we've been running, which is we're going to solve a PDE. We're going to solve a PDE at each time step, only this time we're going to have to actually choose one. So the PDE we're going to actually choose is uh, the Burkes equation. The reason we're doing the Burkes equation is because it's essentially the simplest thing that is both time stepping and nonlinear. And uh, so it's one dimensional problem. Here is your time term. This here is advection. That there is diffusion. And uh, we don't really care about the solutions to this problem. So in order to keep the number of symbols small, I've just done backward Euler and I've written an n plus one on every symbol outside the time derivative. And uh, we're going to use the same simple functional that we have been using all along. So it's the square norm of the solution at the end of time plus the square norm of the initial conditions that uh, we want to do. So that's exactly the same setup as we've been done previously. And here is a piece of hybrid code for this. This one is slightly edited down. I'll show you some real code and run it in a second. This would run. This is all there. Um, so um, I'm guessing everyone who's watching this video with Fibrate. So you have a Fibrate import and we define mesh function space, a U and a U old, uh, and we need a test function. And then you can simply write down your residual um, for each time step and you can solve it each time. Uh, and because I'm trying to minimize the number of lines of code here, there's a solved in there. We, sorry? I don't care, because I don't care what the solution is. Uh, and um, I think it is backwards. It's backwards. Oh, I think you need to integrate by plus. In the what? In, in the, uh, in, um, anyway, this one. Oh. Um, and, um, Not sure about that, but anyway, it doesn't it doesn't matter because this is not we're not interested in the solution. We're only interested in how we take the derivative. So um, the lines in blue are the adjoint lines. Um, so you import five rate adjoint. Uh, essentially, that does two things. It imports some extra symbols from pi adjoint uh, and which is good because we need those. And then it does something very, very bad, which is it switches on the tape recording. So the fact that an import has the side effect of switching on the tape recording is an absolutely appalling piece of uh, UI design for which I apologize. Uh, it was an error we made 10 years ago. We should probably back it out, but it's a big uh, user facing API change. So we'll have to do it with warning and notices and so on. Um, so, um, strictly speaking, actually, line 22, which is in blue, we added it to the adjoint, but it's not um, actually required. And then uh, the compute gradient core at the bottom is an actual core. So what happens when we run this um, is all of the operations that are relevant and we come back in a second to what's a relevant operation, are now recorded on a tape. And the tape is literally a list of operations, a Python list that contains um, operations. And those operations record dependencies exactly as we discussed yesterday. And so what you get is this. So this is exactly the sort of graph we talked about last time. So there are values on this graph which are round dots and there are operations which are square dots. The only difference now is instead of me writing this up on the board, 
This was automatically generated from executing the previous piece of code. Do the round bits also go into the list? Or is it just the, no, the square bit? The, um, so we, we go into a little more detail here, but the, so the square things are blocks and a block is an operation. The round things are block variables. The tape is a list of blocks. So where the round things exist, is that each block carries a list of dependencies and a list of outputs. And those objects are the round objects. And so the dependencies and outputs of each block is the data structure that induces the graph, right? Because they connect up. Um, and so if I switch over to a little bit code uh let me um increase the font size and open the actual code so this is um a slightly less abbreviated version of exactly the same so you can see exactly the same uh code going down there this is actually explicitly written out to be one dimensional um and so here you can actually see um some of the machinery that we can use with this. So um, the core object that we usually work with is a reduced functional object. So a reduced functional object takes in something that we have taped that is scalar valued. And I'm gonna come back in a little bit to a slightly more precise definition of what it means to be something that we have taped. Um, and one or a list of uh, objects that the tape knows about, which we are labeling as being controlled. Controls. So control is something that comes in from Hydra. And this object then has um, methods on it that enable you to uh, rerun or execute uh, the derivative of or the tangent linear model to or the Hessian of uh, the uh, functional evaluated at the current one. Yeah. Does it matter where you declare things as controls? No. Okay. So you're, remember, you, you're just looking at Python code here. Yeah. So there's no, there, there's no magic. This is just a Python library. Uh, so you can declare something to be a controller, sign it into a variable, and then pass it to which is functional. Yeah. No one will ever know. You could, yeah, but by, you know, by sort of, can you declare it immediately after you? Yes. Yeah, set the, yeah. The, the yeah. Okay. Um, so um, there's a couple more things in here, which are sort of high level things that I will point out um, before we dive into lower level code. So if I dive back to my slides here uh, and jump forward a few slides, um, so one of them is this Taylor test that was there, and that's reproduced down here as well. So the thing about our calculation of the um, gradient is we can do a Taylor series with this, right? So if I take J evaluated at m plus some small delta m, that can be approximated as j at m plus the derivative of j at m plus a second order term. So now if I choose a particular m0 essentially at random and evaluate j, I can do that, and evaluate j at m plus delta m, I can do that, and evaluate j at this point, um, at the djdm at the original point, multiply it by, or apply it to m0, I can evaluate all of the terms except the last one on this uh, slide. And if I take the limit as that perturbation goes to zero, or rather I take a sequence of them as m0 shrinks, I can observe whether or not they are converging at second order. And this is an exceptionally sensitive test 
of whether or not I am computing the correct weight. So if you get the wrong gradient, then this will collapse to first order immediately. So anything you put in here will converge to first order because it's multiplied by M0, right? It's linear in M0, um, but only the correct gradient will converge to second order. Uh, you can also do the same thing with the Hessian action and you add the gradient and the Hessian action and then you get something that should converge to third order. And once again, it's a very sensitive test. So if you do the, um, Jack's nodding because he's had that pain with me. Uh, so if you do the Hessian version of this test, then the possible outcomes are it converges at third order, in which case you've done everything right. It converges at second order, in which case your Hessian's wrong, or it converges at first order, in which case your gradient's wrong. So that uh, test. And essentially, when you are setting up new adjoint problems, this should be your go to operation. Because uh, for starters, you might find a problem in PyJoint, but also there's a very high chance that you've set up your problem wrong. And uh, this thing will tell you that a long time before you rip your hair out because none of your optimization problems converge. Um, the other thing to do is to um, go back to this thing over here, to this DAG, and make sure that the DAG also makes sense. So um, it's very, very easy to write a problem where it turns out that your result doesn't actually depend on one of your controls. And you'll be able to see that by looking at this diagram because that literally has, means that there isn't a chain of arrows and bo boxes connecting the control to the function. It's a very effective debugging technique. Okay, so if we go back to this thing, this is in fact um, real code and I can run this. Um, before I do, I will just give you one more, more trivial thing. Uh, FireDrake now includes a object called progress bar. Uh, you can use progress bar yourself and wrap it around an iterator so that uh, your, your time stepping loop prints progress bars so you know how far through your uh, simulation you are. Um, and that's kind of cute and useful. Uh, the reason I actually did it is that when you are debugging the adjoint and you are either running a Taylor test or you're running an optimization, you're under the hood going to run a whole load of forward and adjoint problems, and it can take a long time. And they're, because they run under the hood, you don't get any feedback that they're happy. So what you can now do is attach an appropriate progress bar class, such as the one we give you, to the tape with the name progress bar. This is how you get hold of the tape. You attach progress bar to it. And if you do that, Every time the tape evaluates its functional, its gradient, its tangent linear model, or its Hessian, it will print out a progress bar telling you that it's doing it. And so uh, if I go back to my code, you'll see that I've done that. So what we're doing here is I'm running my problem and I'm running a Taylor test and I am asking for the graph of the alpha. And so I can run that. What's the annotate on H? And I take this false. Uh, uh, when you define H and you do the Taylor test. Oh, I'll come back to that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what's going on then here is. Is it just me who only ever sees David's slides on Zoom? Oh, that's unhelpful. Zoom's, yeah, Zoom's, why does Zoom pause my. Huh? You, you, um, you're, you're probably just sharing the one window. Sharing. Share. Yeah. You're sharing one desktop and you've got the cross desktop. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, no, it seems to be happy with that. That's better. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, what you can see going on here is all of the terms in that Taylor test expansion. So you evaluate the functional at M, and then you evaluate the gradient of the functional at M, and then you evaluate the functional at M plus delta M for, in this case, four different uh, sizes of delta M. And then it tells you what the residuals are and 
it does your logarithms for you to tell you the convergence rates, and I'm going to call that two. So that's uh, very close. Obviously, it's all numerical, so it's only up to your convergence errors and things like that. Um, so that's um, very straight. That is a very straightforward setup. Um, so I will now answer John's um, question. Um, Hang on, where did you see? H equals function D, H assign. Oh, H assign and is false. Yes, okay. So um, when you are running your forward problem, you want every operation to go on the table. Um, when you are doing operations that aren't the forward problem, such as setting up your Taylor test or other things that you don't intend to be part of your adjoint calculation, you don't necessarily want those to end up on the table. Uh, either because it's inefficient or because if you really manage to muck it up, you might be able to induce the wrong answer on, on the tape. And so there's two ways of stopping that from happening. One of them is that um, operations which are annotated will take an annotated false flag, and that enables you to switch off an individual operation. Uh, so if I... Um, didn't do that. Let me just take that out. I can show you. So now, if I open food.pdf, so here is, just blow this up. Here is the diagram of that. Um, so you're not going to be able to read that because it's lots of tiny steps, right? So you can see the repeating pattern as we go down the stage, right? Solve a PDE, assign the old U, solve a PDE, and go on. And then there's this weird thing up in the corner here. What's up in the corner? Why? Why can't I? It's because every release of MacOS makes their PDF viewer worse. Thank you. So up there, you can see the value 0 0.01 being assigned into something. And that's because I have taped that. But because nothing in the calculation depends on it, it's just its own little subgraph that's floating around out there. So that one is nearly unnecessary work. Um, and in fact, the adjoint on the tape will be clever enough to not run over those blocks. So it probably doesn't matter. But there are other circumstances where that would be problematic. The more common way you'll see people switch off annotation is that there is also a context manager for doing it. So and everything inside this will not be annotated. So if we now do this again, oh no. Huh? You're opening PDF, you're not rerunning. I know, I know, but I can't see what I'm doing because Zoom is in the way. Um, so when that's run through again. Um, what are these numbers, 19 and 20? So that is the number of blocks on the tape. So it's the total number of uh, these. If you counted all of the boxes on the bear, you would find a number that was 19 or close to 19. I think in this uh, circumstance, it's probably 20 because if you look carefully, this block here does not have any arrows that lead into the functional. And so that won't get evaluated when the adjoint uh, occurs. Um, so now that's disappeared because we switched off antics. Okay, that's a useful um, segue because now what we want to do is start to look under the hood and understand how the implementation of all these things works. And uh, the switching on and off of annotating all over the place is a, a key feature of this operation. So um, as we mentioned, there are two types of operation in here. Um, there are block variables and there are blocks. So a block variable is a DAG variable is a single assignment code variable, a static single assignment variable, one of the round circuits. So it's a variable which takes exactly one value, its value never changes. It wraps around a program value, which is a usual Python variable whose value changes as we go through the program. 
So that's one type of object. And the other type of object is a block. And those are the things that turn up on the tape. So from higher joints perspective, blocks are a top. Higher joint has no uh, or very little opinion about how things happen inside a block. Uh, it assumes that the blocks know how to differentiate. We'll come on to that in, uh, um, in just a second. Um, so the other thing that you need in order to get block variables is you need data types that know about block variables. So the simplest one of these is the edge float type. So the edge float is a floating point number that will be recorded. And so you can see the general pattern for how this works. So edge float is inherits from float and it also inherits it from overloaded type. An overloaded type is the pyo joint base class for objects that pyo joint knows how to deal with. And so uh, one of the things that you can do wrong in pyo joint um, is you can do an operation on an overloaded type that results in a non overloaded type. And that breaks the chain on the tape. And that will normally show up as a pyo joint error where it says that it expected a overloaded type. Right? Actually, there is a typo in the error message. So it will ask to tell you that it expected an overloaded type. Um, so, uh, so for example, in uh, edge floats come with a bunch of defined operations. But what you can't do is import math and apply, say, math dot square root to an edge float and expect to get an edge float back because math square root is going to give you a float back. And that will break the chain. So if you want to take the square root of an edge float, you have to uh, star star um, 0.5 to, to get so that it does the edge float operation as opposed to the math one. Um, so um, that's how those things work. So let's now look at um, a little bit of our code. Let me go to another window. So um, let's um, so let's get an overloaded type first. So we can have a look at what then an overloaded type has, um, and what it. Um, main the, the key thing it has is it has a block variable member, and that block variable uh, member contains the current block variable associated with this program variable, right? So the overloaded type is a program variable. It's a normal Python variable we use in our program. Its value changes over time, and it has a block variable associated with it. And every time an operation changes the value of the overloaded type, it has to call create block variable on the overloaded type so that there's a new block variable associated with each distinct value that this variable takes. So we create an initial one. Um, and uh, then uh, we'll see in a second, uh, cases where these variables change and they add other ones. Um, there's some other mechanisms underneath that are more technical that we don't um, need to care about in too much detail. I will um, raise these ones. So specific um, instances of this, so edge flow or the pygrid function is another overloaded type. Uh, need to know how to save themselves. And so they have to implement AD create uh, checkpoint and AD restore at checkpoint, which is how they are going to store their value somewhere and how they're going to retrieve their value back from a stored location. And uh, that can be as simple as calling a copy method and shoving it onto dot underscore checkpoint and then copying it back. Um, but it could be more complicated. So Firebreak will currently support this checkpointing of our joint, in which case the thing that you get as a checkpoint um, value here isn't a copy of the function. It's a little struct that tells you which file in which, uh, which path this function is and 
hence read it from there. Um, so this, so in this sense, that that's all completely abstract. Um, similarly, they have to provide um, the um, implementations, which are usually just falls back to their own methods for the operations that are required in a Hilbert space, right? Because the Pi adjoint does, in, in order to apply adjoint variables and to do the summation that applies when a variable is used twice, a, a Pi adjoint does have to be able to assume that all overloaded type variables live in a Hilbert space and therefore you can add them, scale them, and take your products off them. Um, so I, I think I'll stop talking about that stuff there. And now we'll talk about then this um, the friend of this. So overloaded type, remember, is the way that we uh, turn a program variable into something PyJoint can deal with. We also have, alongside that, block variables, which are these frozen variables that go along the way. And so here is block variable. And largely speaking, a block variable is just a mechanism for attaching all of the potential values that could be on the tape together. So depending on what I'm currently doing, if I've just evaluated the tape, then I have a value which is going to live in the checkpoint. But if I have just evaluated the adjoint, I might have an adjoint value. If I'm evaluating the tangent linear model, I'll have a TLM value and I can have a Hessian value as well. Um, and so essentially this is just tying them together. Um, the um, other ones down here are more technical things that we won't go into that are used by the tape either to work out which operations to work on or to work out when they should be used. So um, the floating type thing, I'm not going to go into in these talks. It's a very complicated piece of code uh, that deals with the fact that um, variables uh, might get modified at places that are not obvious from the Python code. So I said, oh, it's very easy. What we have to do is establish a new pop variable um, every time something changes. Well, what if I had a mixed function space and I made a new variable by indexing into the mixed function space and then I changed the value of the original function by talking to the original variable and not the new variable? And so floating types are a mechanism for having done the indexing but not having the value of that indexing crystallized until I actually use the value, because the relevant value isn't the value when I index, it's the value when I use it. Um, you can imagine that some of these things took a lot of people. I didn't do this bit. This is all Sebastian Mitrish. Um, and I think Joe will work some of it. Okay, so that's how uh, the block variables work. We now want to shift our view and look at how the operations work and therefore how we get these block variables. And so the uh, easiest way to do that is actually to look at what happens when we take stuff. And I have a slide for this. So this is um, the assignment method or a, or a decorator which is applied to the assignment method of function. So this is uh, function dot assign. That's why it's taking self and other. And um, what we do, this is the generic patterns, they will all look basically like this, is uh, first of all, if we weren't annotating, so if we were in normal fibrate mode, because this code is there all the time in fibrate, we always traverse this code path. If we weren't annotating, what would happen is uh, annotate tape would be false. So we wouldn't do any of this stuff. We would get to here, we'd stop annotating, but we stopped anyway, and we just call a sign. 
and we wouldn't do this part and we'd return. So if annotating is off, we just perform the operation. If, annotated, if annotation is on when we hit this point, which is essentially what this is testing, right? So those things are testing that. This thing here is an optimization that says that if you do a um, assignment of a variable to itself, it uh, won't mm -hmm. take because that's a no-op. And we were, uh, this is in fact, Diane, you discovered this. Um, we were uh, in this case where we um, do uh, U and U old assignments, we were storing the states on the tape twice, doubling our memory footprints. And this, that, 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 that small number of characters there halves the memory footprint of the IJ. Um, thank you. <laughs> yep. Um, so, um, so, so what do we do if we are annotating? What we do is we make a block and the blocks, these are all subclasses of a core block class, but you have a different block class for every um, sort of operation. So there is a function assign block, which is for assigning into fibrate functions. Um, and function assign block actually just needs to take self and other because those are the things you need to know, know in order to do it a, um, an assignment. And so other will get tagged as a dependency of the block. And we put the block onto the tape. What and this is the usual pattern. What we haven't done yet is we haven't um, worked out what the outputs are. We always do the operation, grab the outputs, and put them onto the outputs afterwards. The reason why it has this funny structure, because you think this is dumb, why don't I do the operation first and then put the block on the tape, is side effects. So if this operation um, changed anything in the right hand side, we would end up taping the wrong stuff. So you could say, in order to have a, a, a provably correct implementation, regardless of what the operation is, you have to make the block, do the operation, record the output, and strictly that would. Um, there are side effects that modify the right hand like the arguments, maybe more than just outputs as well. So if there are side effects which modify the arguments, um, then uh, one of two things might happen. They might be recorded as outputs directly, or they might spew other blocks, either of which could validly happen. Um, because you can either think of an operation with side effects as an operation with two outputs, or as two blocks, one after each other on the table. Either of those is a fine way of thinking about the same problem, right? So yeah. either is a legitimate implementation. Um, and so then you notice when we add output, this is the point at which we call that create block variable method so that this, so self will be an overloaded type. Um, and the overloaded type that is added is added with a brand new fresh block variable attached to it because its value has just changed. That's what it means for it to be an output. So I think I think I didn't quite follow why um, why you can't. So I guess assign it. the way in which this could be wrong if you reordered lines twenty and twenty one ahead of seventeen and eighteen is if assign modified the type of block variable that self makes. Right. Sorry. I, so what I was suggesting to you, you can't. Um, you can't possibly be do 21 ahead of um, 18 because in, well, you could in this particular case, because we happen to know that we're assigning into self, right? But in the general case, we don't actually have the output variable yet. If this were a free function, Line eighteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so we need to do something to get the return value. That's right. So you can't you can't assume you've got the return value until you've executed the operation. So yeah. So I guess I guess more more correctly, line twenty one should be rent dot create block variable. Uh, I mean, it could be either because we know in this circumstance that those are the same. Okay. Uh, those are the same variable. That's just the strange semantics of 
uh, how a sign works. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, yes, okay. So um, that's how the annotation works. And you notice now our tape's got another block on it, right? And that's the, the consequence of doing that step. Um, and um, what happened inside the block constructor? So let's go look at um, the function assign block, which lives in um, here. That's the that's block. Sorry, that's PyJoint block. Um, where's Here we go, here is the function assign block. Um, so when we um, built this block, uh, what it did was it added other as a dependency. And that's essentially the whole story, right? The rest of this is just casting to make that work. So uh, that is the, essentially the, the, the whole point of this thing is to do that. Um, and um, that under the hood will call a method on other, and that's because of more complicated things to do with checkpointing. We don't need to go there. We can just assume it's this is the bit where the bug is. Okay. <laughs> um, so now we can see what a um, one of these objects looks like, and so. They have to know. So PyJoint doesn't know how to differentiate a block or how to evaluate a block. So the subclasses of block all have to tell you how to do all the relevant operations. <clears throat> so um, here is the ones for doing an adjoint, and I'll explain prepare and component in just a second. Um, and here are the ones for doing the tangent linear model, and. Uh, here is the ones for doing the Hessian, and here is the ones for doing recompute. And um, this is the simplest one, right? So here is just calling a sign. And so the reason for that, uh, the reason you need to recompute is because one of the things you need to be able to do with the reduced functional is evaluated in a new value. And it'll rerun the tape and has to do all the operations. So that does that. Okay, so why is there why are there prepares and recomputes? And um, prepare recompute component is actually a confusing one. But this is a better example. The reason for this is that um, when you compute a uh, an operation, especially when you compute an adjoint, you have to compute an adjoint variable to every input, and respectively, when you do a forward operation, you have to compute a output for every output or a tangent linear for every output. And those are potentially separate operations. So you do different computations to prepare each adjoint value. But also, very, very commonly, there's shared work over the adjoint of this operation. So if you think about what happens if you are solving a PDE as your step, you have to compute the adjoint PDE, and then you have to apply the adjoint PDE to the derivatives of all the inputs. And that's how you get all of the uh, adjoints there. And so in the prepare step, you solve the adjoint PDE, and in the compute steps, you do all of the separate components. And so effectively, this is a mechanism for allowing blocks to uh, only implement the bits that they really need to. And those work the same way for all of these um, operations. And so we can see what's done with that if we go look at the tape. So in PyJoint, we have PyJoint, PyJoint tape. And um, let me get down to the, here is the tape class. Um, and there is literally the list of blocks. Right. So when you add things onto a tape, and um, what then the tape does is simply loops over blocks and asks blocks to do things. It's, its whole sole purpose in life, right? So 
Um, here is, um, uh, that's how you delete a, uh, a table. Now, this is a better example. So um, you can uh, reset all of the data on the block. And how do you do that? You loop over all the blocks and ask them to reset themselves. And um, you loop over any extraneous data that isn't in the blocks. This is for global state. This is used in things like checkpointing to keep track of where the checkpoint files are and things like that. Um, so similarly then, when we come to evaluate something, all we do, so here is evaluating the Azure under the tape. What do I do? I loop over the adjoint of the tape backwards, and I tell everybody to evaluate their adjoint. Um, and the markings uh, thing here is the mechanism by which we eliminate blocks that shouldn't be evaluated, the how to not to do everything. Same thing applies to TLM, same thing applies to Hessian, um, and their their reset as well. So uh, that's essentially the story of how this works. It's very, very simple. So now if we look at the reduced functional, which I've got the right one. Yeah, oh, that's reduced functional number. Uh, what a reduced functional basically does is store a um, a functional which is just a scalar overloaded type coming soon. Doesn't have to be a scalar overloaded type. This is in the same stuff because so we've all been thinking about the situation where we have a scalar J and we want to JDU. In principle, I can have a non-scalar J and compute the adjoint. What I now need is a non-trivial adjoint input, right? The, the adjoint input will no longer just be a one. It has to be an adjoint variable in the space that my functional maps into. And in a standalone code, that's not usually very useful. But if my fired rate pro, uh, calculation were simply a small part of a bigger code, for example, because it's embedded in a PyTorch model, then PyTorch will hand me that adjoint value. And it's my job to propagate that through and give PyJoint uh, Py the adjoints to my inputs. And so that's the generalization. But now that's just a scalar. And here are the controls. And um, what happens is, so let's start with call. Here's the call method. And what the call method does in its guts is loop over all of the blocks of the tape and recompute. Mm -hmm. uh, it sets the control values first, and that's how you can evaluate the tape at different control values. And it runs through. And having done that, you can call, for example, the um, derivative method. And the derivative method will call compute gradient and compute gradient basically just calls evaluate adjoint in the tape. So this will loop through the tape backwards. This is, at this level, this stuff is all actually relatively simple. Um, so when I, if, if you go down to like the, the, the compute thing again. Yeah. So I guess this is, uh, so the, the blocks, know their dependencies like so the arrows between blocks kind of know where things come from so you don't have to so recompute doesn't give you an output that you feed to the next block it's like that happens behind the scenes right so when you recompute a block that block will change the stored value on the block variables that are its output Right? Okay. So each each yeah. circle on the tape gets a new value as we go through. And that doesn't violate the rule that the value of circles doesn't change because when we recompute a value, we've essentially reset all the values. So that is the one assignment that that oval is ever going to get. Right, so yeah. uh, 
Yeah. And um, and this line here, the self-marked controls thing, uh, that is ensuring that you don't ever recompute a control value. Because a control value could be any oval on the tape. And that oval could in particular have an incoming palette, right? So you can choose a value as a control, which you originally computed in a tape's way, and now say, ah, now I'm fixing that value and I'm going to tell you its value. Its value. And so it's important that the tape doesn't uh, overwrite that value with the result of evaluating the previous operation. And that, that prevents that from happening. And that is in essence, the guts of how PyJoint works. But that is like the, obviously there are uh, more subtleties of, um, I don't think I have anything else to say here. Yeah, um, there, um, there are more subtleties in here, which are, you know, how do we do the Hessian? How do we do checkpointing? How do boundary conditions work? And we'll probably, we'll talk about those in subsequent sessions, but we are actually now at the point where you hopefully can understand what it is that PyJoint is doing when you tape and, uh, tape and run. Are there any final questions? Uh, does yeah. the order in the list of the tape uh, really matter? So the you have to evaluate the tape in a depth first manner, right? So you have to evaluate. Um, let's go back to the, the picture. Um, so the the graph is ordered. So you have to evaluate the block at the start of an arrow before you any block that is connected downstream of it by arrows. Um, and there are, in principle, a large number of um, valid depth first um, uh, warps of the graph. Um, but in particular, the order you evaluated the box the first time around, which is the order you taped in them, must be one such valid order. And so the simple thing to do is to simply evaluate them in the original order. Um, so what you do do, you might have seen we flew past, there was an optimized tape uh, call which gets called at a certain point to drop the ones that don't actually exist. Um, good, any last questions? Excellent, in that case, uh, we shall uh, leave that one there. Sharing and in the call, bye everybody. Thanks.